Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about deep water developments. So it's a basic primer, it's in my basic primer series, and the purpose is for people who are not facilities engineers to understand what facilities engineers have to face in terms of problems, to be able to have productive conversations with them. So why is deep water oil and gas so important? Well, 70% of the volumes that have been discovered since 2000 by international oil companies have been in deep water. Uh, I use 250 meters plus, other people use 300, other people use 400, but it's it doesn't make that much of a difference. It, most of them tend to be in deeper water than that. And most of the really big fields, the giants, 1 billion barrel of oil is equivalent or more, that have been found recently, i.e. since 2000, have been in deep water. So that's the uh, fields of Brazil, fields in the eastern Mediterranean, fields of East Africa, fields in Guyana, Suriname relatively recently, um, West Africa, etc. So most of the new provinces of sex as well have been in deep water too. So it's becoming more important, particularly for IOCs. Now deep water really kind of kicked off at the end of the 1970s. First production was from the cognac field in the Gulf of Mexico by Shell. And there was a lot of pioneering work done in the North Sea, Gulf of Mexico, and particularly in Brazil by Petrobras in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, since then, it's now become fairly mainstream. 2019, according to Wood McKenzie, an oil and gas consultancy, about 10% of the world's oil uh, production, 10 million barrels of oil equivalent, 10 billion barrels of oil per day, were from deep water settings. Now, in terms of international oil and gas companies, it'll be a much higher percentage than that because people like Saudi Aramco or Rosneft don't really have much of a deep water presence. They don't kind of need to because they have quite a lot of stuff onshore uh, within their respective countries. So, deep water is a future. Not the only part of the future, there are other parts of the future, but it's a very major part. We need to understand the special things that happen within those situations as geologists and geophysicists. So here's a graph from Wood Mackenzie showing the evolution of deep water production and the relative importance of different countries. So where are the deep water locations? So Gulf of Mexico, then uh, South Atlantic, so both the western part of the South Atlantic, the east coast of South America, so Guyana, Suriname, a lot of recent big discoveries by uh, by Exxon, um, but uh, then quite a lot of significant discoveries of the coast of Brazil, both across the equatorial margin and also going down south into the Santos. Then on the other side, on West Africa, so everything from Senegal, Gambia, through Ghana, Nigeria, Angola, recent big discoveries in Namibia and South Africa. And then the gas provinces in the eastern Mediterranean, so that's Egypt and Israel, and uh, East Africa, so that's Tanzania and uh, Mozambique. East coast of India, a lot of uh, activity in Southeast Asia, and also the Northwest Shelf in Australia, plus also Norway. And potentially others could emerge, uh, maybe East coast of North America and other parts of, uh, of the world. But deep water is the future, so we need to understand where things are coming from. So first of all, I'll just mention briefly decision-making systems in oil companies. Yes, we do actually have some. So here's a typical chart. Most oil companies use it. Some of them actually even change the colors. So you have the explore stage. Great, you've got a discovery. Now you need to select the appropriate concept. And this is what I'll be talking about today. Once you've selected your concept, you need to define it, do the detailed design, do the detailed planning, get firm project approval, then execute the development plan, store the facilities, drill the wells, get first production, then produce, that's operations, and then decommission at the end. So we'll talk about concept selection, and it's very important to get this bit right, because you can either make a bit, a fair bit of money or lose a fair bit of money if you get it wrong. So different types of projects that we'll face, and there are basically four types, four categories. At the top, you have the uneconomic. These are never gonna work under any circumstances. So it's effectively a dry hole, even though you found some hydrocarbons. Very painful, but you need to learn your lessons and move on. Then you have at the bottom here, you have the robust. The oil, everything's in green. So the project works in all cases. Um, we want to reduce the uncertainties a little bit. We want to optimize the development plan. Look to realize the upside, protect the downside. Got one of those? Great. The difficult ones are these two. So the feasible works in the high case, but doesn't really work in the mid case. Definitely doesn't work in the low case. So what can we do about it? Investigate, look at what can be done, try to kill or cure. Maybe we can sell it off to someone else for whom it's far more 
likely to work than it is for us. And then the viable, where in the low case, things don't work out. Mid case, things are good. High case, things might even be great. You need to try to protect against the downside. So we need to do a lot of planning. So when you're looking at factors that are in selecting a concept, there's three basic parts of the triangle. There's the cost, technical factors, and the risk. Cost, well, capital costs, your capex, your upfront expenditure, before you even produce anything. And the operating costs, when you're actually operating it. Could be some third party costs. For example, if you're producing via as a satellite via someone else's facility, you have to pay tariffs. Maybe some tax implications, maybe some currency implications, depending where you build the facilities. Could be cost recovery if you're working in a production sharing contract environment. There could also be situations where you might have uh, local country content. We need to spend some of the um, capex locally. Can that be done? Then you have the technical factors, you know, looking at the subsurface, geology, which is my world, and petroleum engineering, try to figure out what's going on underneath. Then the surface facilities, well, what facilities do we need? What processing do we need? What are the fluids like? Oil, gas, water. Um, are there any impurities that we need to deal with, any nasties? Operational flexibility, you know, how flexible do we need to be in terms of potentially adding extra facilities, uh, spreading our costs, etc. What interventions do we need to make in the wells? Do we need to enter the wells or not? Um, any additional opportunities we may have to feed in, either our own or third party satellites? And what's our corporate experience? What do we mean? What are we good at? And what are we less good at? We've got to do some new technology that we already understand. That's kind of a risk. And moving on to risks, there's execution risk. You know, how well can we do this? Particularly in terms of cost overruns and time overruns. Now, oil and gas industry has been fairly lousy in terms of project performance. You know, average projects are 20% plus overrun in terms of cost and time, and that's not acceptable. That's not good. We need to do better. Operational risks, security risks. Potentially, if you are in a difficult place um, in terms of security, environmental risk, we want to do things as cleanly as possible. So how easy are these risks to mitigate? How well do we understand them? So when we're selecting concept, we need to make the best decisions possible. Protect and enhance shareholder value. That's what we do. That's what we're here for. Reducing uncertainty to, to acceptable levels. We're never going to eliminate it, but we need to understand it. In defining the scope to enable progress, best possible option we can do. And then get that through the corporate and government decision gates. Keeping our managements, keeping our joint venture partners and keeping the government, who are ultimately donors of the resource, happy. Challenges are, well, we've got imperfect data. We never have as much data as we want, but we have to make a decision with what we've got. We've got pressures, sometimes conflicting pressures from our own management to joint venture partners, host governments. We need to keep it all together and we need to be cost effective. We need to be time effective. We need to do things safely. We need to do things right. Not easy. So let's look at a potential fictional oil field. Uh, I have faced similar challenges to this. So you're in 600 meter water depth, about 65 kilometers from shore, got limited local facilities, limited infrastructure. But South Atlantic, good mid ocean conditions, not really any hurricanes or typhoons to worry about. So at least that's one thing that's, that's there. We had a PSA and the government's keen to proceed the development. They want things done. The limited local content rules, so that is a, uh, a plus because then we can choose the optimum yard around the world to produce our facility. Most people just go to Korea. They're very good. Um, we've got two joint venture partners, another IOC and a national company. So we have to keep those people uh, in, a, in a reasonably good place. A uh, bit of subsurface, Cretaceous Turbidite Reservoir, good reservoir performance, good deliverability, uh, good reservoir connectivity assumed within the segments within the field, um, which is good. We assume it's an active aquifer. We've got potential problem with sand production, so we have to have appropriate completions. Um, relatively deep below seabed and uh, about 100 square kilometers. So, you know, reasonable field, typical for that sort of field that we would look in somewhere like Guyana, Suriname, or uh, in uh, in West Africa. We've got a black oil, which is good uh, in terms of relatively low gas oil ratio, a bit of wax. So we need to ensure that... Uh, that that is dealt with either by inhibitors or downhole heating and we also have no nasties which is very useful because that simplifies our plant about 200 million barrels which is within the scope which is actually quite a large field so what development plan should we choose so what's the, what are the options that are available to us 
So different types of options. So FPSO, that's kind of really the default option for something like this. And I'll talk about FPSOs in a minute, but you can have semi submersible production platforms, very popular in the Gulf of Mexico. SPARs and TLPs, very popular in the Gulf of Mexico as well. Not so much outside that. And subsea wellheads tied back to a shore facility. Uh, that's what you tend to use for something that's very gassy or volatile oil. We have a large amount of gas that you import into the local um, market. So something like Egypt, for example, um, that uh, that was a project I was involved in that, uh, that did that. Um, again, they all have advantages and disadvantages, and we'll talk a little bit about them. So first of all, the water depths. Now we're at 600 meters, so this is out. Fixed platform, not going to happen. So we might have a compliant tower. We might have uh, floating production systems. Might have tension leg platforms. Might go pure subsea. Uh, might do a spa platform. Again, depends on cost, depends on value, depends on how quickly we can do things done. Now, most people would have, under these sort of circumstances, would use an FPSO, floating production uh, storage and offtake vessel. So this example, a picture of one in Brazil, and this is a picture with a, of a diagram of how these things work. So you've got some subsea wellheads uh, coming up to a central manifold with a riser coming into the, uh, into the processing vessel where the hydrocarbons are then processed, and then a shuttle tank comes along and takes it away. Um, now, FBSO is flexible and ideal for short life projects, particularly if you can lease them rather than own them outright. Obviously, that increases your OPEX a lot, but uh, decreases your CapEx. You can also use them for early phase production. So, for example, an early production system, which you can then replace with a larger, newer system. And they're a little bit modular relative to some of the other uh, facilities that we talk about, which tend to be come only really in size XXL. Um, difficult things. Um, gas export can be difficult. I mean, you can hook up a, a pipeline to shore to one of these things, but because we've got relatively low GOR, we will dispose of the gas by effectively re-injecting it back into the reservoir. So what are the pressures aboard options we have? We have an active aquifer, so we'll probably go for something like water injection. It tends to get you the best recovery, but it costs a bit more because you need to put injector wells uh, down dip from the reservoir, which provide you pressure support down here. You'll also have some gas injection to uh, get rid of the produced gas and dispose of it safely back in the reservoir where it originally came from. You wouldn't do depletion in this case. You might do that for a gas field. You will do that for a gas field. You might do that for a volatile oil. Next decision is what type of wellheads are we going to have? Are we going to have dry trees or wet trees? Dry trees, you can do a lot of intervention, but they only use spars or TLP. So if you're going to FPSO, you're going to have to use subsea wellheads like this, which you cannot re-enter very easily. That makes life a little bit more difficult because you need uh, ROVs, uh, deep diving, etc., to do any servicing. You need a specialist rig if you're going to do anything within the borehole itself. And no post-production logging, which uh, makes data collection a bit difficult. Template or cluster. Again, if you're going for a spar tree, you're going to dry trees that require template, which is all the wells in a central location like this picture here. Uh, wet trees, uh, subsea trees, um, a bit more flexibility. You have a central manifold and you have these things deposited around it. Exporting hydrocarbons, uh, we would tend to go with an offtake tanker. So there's a picture, there's a producing um, FBSO and there's a tanker hooked up to it and that, that would gather up the oil on a regular basis as the tanks within uh, the FBSO fill up. You might have a separate mooring buoy if you put these things further away. If you've got gas, you might either put a pipeline to land or alternatively floating LNG facility, which is quite a novel new idea. Decision considerations is a lot of upfront capex. What's your opex? Politics and fiscal. And there's a slide here from uh, Hess, uh, an American oil company who are partners in, uh, in Guyana, and that's comparing a deep water field with a uh, unconventional tight oil field in, uh, in West Texas and the Permian Basin, Delaware Basin in in, uh, in West Texas. So significantly better reservoir quality. You know, peak production coming up fairly quickly, but a lot of capex up front. Um, big deliverability for the well, 63 million barrels per individual well, versus around 1 million barrels ultimate recovery for an average well in in, in West Texas in the um, in the light tight oil environment. Gain development costs. This was the figure at the time. These things tend to vary, so a company would need to compare uh, any deep water field with other opportunities. So just to sum up, it's complicated, but we need to talk to engineers. So happy modeling. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.